Welcome to the show. I hope you've had a great week. I'm Julie Yashiro and you're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. This week we discuss health matters with Nigerian Minister of State for Health Ali Pate and of course Africa's top 10. This week we're looking at the countries that provide the best health care on the African continent. Great to have you with us. was appointed Minister of State for Health in Nigeria in 2011. It's no secret that the African continent faces great challenges in terms of access to health care, but also the provision of quality health services to the African population. We sought his views on this issue. We wanted to find out what is he doing for Nigeria and what would he suggest across the African continent. Let's take a look at what Ali Pate had to say. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for finding time to be with us. Let's talk about health and Nigeria. That is your docket. Um, and you are a health professional. That's your background. What are you seeking to do uh, at the helm of the Ministry of Health in Nigeria? The basic issue we have has to do with population health outcomes. Uh, the children are dying from preventable causes. Our mothers die in the course of giving birth. That's the foundation for any health system, uh, first of all, to address that. And what we're trying to do for child morbidity and mortality, diseases that afflict our children and kill them needlessly, that are largely vaccine preventable, is to ensure vaccines are available to our children wherever they are. Not only in the urban centers or children of the world to do, but also rural children and children from poor families. Vaccines are proven to be very efficacious. They are very effective in preventing diseases like measles, like polio, uh, like pneumonia, other bacterial diseases that can kill children. Many children in Africa, as well as in Nigeria, don't have access to those life-saving medications. So getting those vaccines to them is one of our most important priority. And we hope the next decade will be actually a decade of vaccines for Nigerian children to save their lives so that they can grow up to be adults, to be adults who will participate in our economy and be the leaders of the future. And for the mothers of those children to also not die needlessly in the course of childbirth. Pregnancy is not a disease, but yet many million, uh, many thousands of mothers die in the course of pregnancy. And you can prevent a mother from dying due to pregnancy related complications or childbirth related complications by ensuring that she has access to antenatal care, several leaders during pregnancy and having skilled birth attendants when they're about to deliver and after delivery to ensure that the immediate post-delivery period is safe for her and for the newborn as well. This is more relevant, in fact, in our country, in Nigeria, for the rural women, for the poorer women, than for the urban and wealthier women. So we're focusing on primary health care system as a way of delivering those services into the nicks and crannies of our country and to reach all kinds of populations so that women get to attend internal care when they are pregnant and when they come to deliver, they get the health workers the frontline health workers, not necessarily doctors. Most pregnancy uh, is actually going to be normal. A portion of it will be complicated. But you need the frontline community health worker, midwife, village health worker to be able to attend to the woman in the rural area. And if there are complications, to have a place to refer them so that they can get attended to. That's sort of the focus of our effort at the moment. It's wonderful to hear that. I'm ambassador of a, a campaign called Stand Up for African Mothers uh, and the importance of training midwives to be able to provide services to people who simply cannot reach health facilities and clinics. So it's wonderful to hear the government in Nigeria is focusing on that area. I want to come to your story now. And very interesting, you lived outside of Nigeria for many years and made a decision to come back. Uh, what influenced that decision? Well, I had the fortune of working in other parts of Africa, but also working internationally in several countries in East Asia, in the Pacific Islands, as well as in uh, the United States where I did my training in medicine and infectious diseases. But Africa is home. As, a, as an African, wherever I go and whatever I do, I need to see how I can help make Africa better and make Nigeria better, because at the end of it all, that's my home. 
and the opportunity came in 2008 for me to lead the Nigerian National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, which is focusing on improving access to basic services by all Nigerians. And my experiences working in several countries all over the world came to bear. I'm a health professional, and I came to lead this agency, and we made tremendous impact impact in the areas that you've mentioned earlier, the maternal health, we're able to deploy within a very short period of time from 2009 to 2011, 4,000 midwives in 1,000 rural primary health care centers under a scheme we call Midwife Service Scheme, the largest scheme of its kind. Now, that is, in my own view, is a, due to a combination of one, the local actors who have been there, who knew the local context, but also the global experience that I've been able to have, as well as the regional experience. I lived in the Gambia, for instance, in the early 90s. I also worked other parts of the world, as well as in Africa. So the combination of that, and with an institution that's trying to deliver that as its mandate, we're able to actually, within a very short period of time, deliver some very good results, and we're building on that now in my portfolio. So you come across as a passionate African doing their part to build the continent. Let's take a look at Africa today. The mood is very optimistic that Africa is moving forward. What do you think about the potential of the continent right now? Well, I think we're on the verge of a major uh, shift in terms of the role that Africa, Africa plays on the global stage. The population side, I mean, the global, global population at the moment is getting to a point where we've never had this youthful population as we have now. Most of that youth population is in Africa and it's going to, it is going to continue to go that way for the next period of time. So Africa stands to gain tremendously by virtue of the population that it has in the years to come. While other parts of the world may actually face shrinking or stabilizing populations, Africa has the potential to actually expand and in fact provide labor to other parts of the countries, or other part, parts of the world. Now, to tap into that what is called the demographic dividend, we need to have investments in the quality of that people that we actually have, the population that we have, the youth that we have in terms of education, health, uh, social protection, making sure they're healthy, they start families and they are participating in our governance. That is what will enable us manifest that potential that Africa will deliver to the rest of the world. I think it's a period of optimism and if we do the right things at the macro level, in terms of managing our own human resources now, but also into the future, I think we'll tap into that potential for a very long period of time. But on the other hand, if we miss that opportunity, what happened in other parts of the uh, world, or in North Africa, for instance, in terms of the uh, political upheavals, could actually manifest if we don't manage the youthful population and harness the potential that they have to offer. Leadership in Africa is critical. Our societies have revolved around respect, even awe for our leaders. Slowly we're seeing what is being described as an awakening that has happened in the North. People are getting more involved in the democratic process. They feel their voice should be heard. And I, I think this is happening across the continent. In such a dynamic environment, what do you think African leaders need to have in terms of attributes to be able to manage to lead in an effective manner? I think this idea of participation, citizen participation is very key. Inevitably with information technology, uh, act of governance actually has changed. So governments do not necessarily have the monopoly of information anymore. And so the leaders have to engage, how to find ways to engage with their citizenry in formulating policies, but also in the act of governance itself. Because it's no longer one big uh, locus of leadership. It's a multi-focal, multi uh, let's say there are several foresight of leadership within our societies and governments have to come to terms to that, with that in terms of involving different segments, different stakeholders and managing information flow between government as well as the citizens. Uh, it will take a different, t let's say, type of uh, leaders uh, to optimize this potential in order for us to move forward and uh, reap the potential that we do have as a continent. So they must be responsive they must be fully engaged. Does it take a level of humility or just appearance of humility? Absolutely, I think it, it, it will take genuine, genuineness, but also humility to acknowledge the role of citizens in governance, particularly given the shift in terms of the power of government when it comes to information. 
and uh, the technologies that we have now, the social media networks have changed a lot of things with governance in our continent. Not only in our continent, but all over the world. So our leaders have to acknowledge that. Uh, the transparency that is required uh, from our leaders, actually the standards has been escalated much, much higher than it has been ever in the past. So leaders have to be genuine in acknowledging that, but also genuine in their effort to engage with their citizenry in a constructive manner so that societies can move forward. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Welcome back to the show. Right now, let's go back to Ali Pate, Minister of State for Health in Nigeria, and hear more on his thoughts about health in Africa. Let's talk now about the citizenry. We've just highlighted, you've mentioned the power that they have through the social media platforms, and with it comes responsibility. Do you think the vast majority of African citizenry are responsible? Well, I am an optimist, and I really believe that, yes, that at the end of it all, uh, if, you, if you localize it to communities, to societies where people live, People want what is good for themselves. They really want to do good. I don't believe in our societies, a typical African society, people wake up and say, let's go and destroy. They want to build. They have felt needs and they express them. Oftentimes, those needs may not be registered, perhaps, at the higher levels unless they have an avenue to channel them. So if you look at it on aggregate, most of what would be transmitted would be in a very positive mindset. Some might hijack it, but those would be in the fringes. I don't believe that they're the predominant uh, uh, players in terms of uh, the engagement between government and the people. So leaders have to acknowledge, of course, that there are those at the fringes, but at the core of it, people would want to provide ideas as to how to improve things or when things are not going well. It's very difficult as a leader if you are not going the right way and you're criticized. But leaders have to get used to getting contrary views to what they actually believe and adjust. Even if they don't agree, at least acknowledge that. I mean, one of the issues that we do deal with on the continent is, is, is the issue of ethnicity and highly ethnicized political environments in some countries. There's also the issue of fundamentalism in, in, in the religious uh, area. Um, some security concerns in Nigeria. What is the situation at the moment? How would you describe it? Well, the security situation in Nigeria uh, wasn't in the last uh, one year, I would say, but in the last few months, I've seen improvement, even in the kinds of attacks that have been perpetuated. Uh, if you go to the northeastern part of Nigeria, where I have been, in the last two months, I've visited four out of the six states that are in the northeastern part of the country. And life continues, and government is actually, the state governments are trying to build their societies, continue with the act of governance, providing immunization services, uh, basic health services, building hospitals, building roads, despite the challenges in pockets uh, of areas within those societies. So the view from the grassroots and from the ground is not the same as that that you might see from the international arena. Because obviously the 1% uh, success that a terrorist might have will dominate the news item while at the grassroots, at the community level, at the cell level, you might find jobs being created. Let me give an example. There's an outfit that uh, started an agribusiness in northeastern Nigeria in the last one year. Despite all the security challenges, it's been able to develop a very large farmland and employ youth, employ people in the societies, and transform livelihoods, despite all the violence that you might be hearing from outside the continent. So, Going forward, I think the security challenge that we're facing would die down. I think our country is moving forward in many fronts. Uh, there's a transformation agenda at play, both on the agricultural side, technology side, uh, the trade and investment sector, for instance, is trying to diversify our economy. But we also are working on the health and education side to harness the human capital that is in our country for the future uh, of our country. Okay. Let's talk about Africa generally and the future for this continent. What do you see 
uh, Africa uh, looking like in the next 10 years or so? Paint the picture for us. I see Africa in the next 10 years as a much more integrated continent that trades more increasingly among itself uh, with an important role for the diaspora, which uh, will, I believe, play a significant role contributing to what is already going on in the continent. Uh, it will be a youthful, con youthful continent, uh, more youthful than any other continent. Uh, I still believe that Africa will remain a very youthful continent. And uh, it will be growing faster than many. It's still growing faster than any other continent, and I believe that trend will continue. The window for reaping the demographic dividend is just going to open in the few years to, to come for many African countries, and I believe that our countries are poised to take advantage of that. So I see a decade that will usher in more prosperity on the continent. I'll see, uh, I see a continent that has more established democratic institutions and uh, a very engaged citizenry in a large part of it. It's a very optimistic picture. What's the greatest challenge to getting there? Well, I think um, we have immediate challenges when we come to employment, job creation. We have millions of youth in several countries that are either uh, unemployed, underemployed, out of school, and they could threaten the growth potential that we have for the future. So how do you tackle that? while making the investments that are needed for us to see a better future for all our peoples in the years to come. I think that's one major challenge. We haven't completely dealt with the issue of disease and death uh, in our countries. We still have a long way to go when you deal with, uh, when you mention diseases like malaria, like HIV in some parts of the continent, uh, the basic health agenda, the immunization. I mentioned we're trying to boost immunization uh, service delivery in our country, but I think in many other countries in the continent, there will be several uh, thousands of children that would die needlessly from vaccine preventable disease. And that's human capital that is lost, uh, uh, maternal mortality, is still a major challenge. So we need to work on the ensuring universal coverage to basic services uh, for our people, and it's a challenge. It will need lots of investments from governments that are struggling to build on infrastructure, as well as uh, to provide security and other things. So those immediate challenges um, uh, do exist and uh, do remain, but with uh, competent leadership, uh, with engaged leadership, I believe that uh, those challenges can be dealt with. And, and serious investments in health save the country the huge cost um, that they would have to face if they, you know, if they had not spent the money on health. I mean, we see the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for instance, pouring money into malaria and, and various other issues, and yet our governments don't quite allocate, well, not quite, they simply don't allocate enough funds to health. Is that, is that something you think needs to be looked at? Yes, let me just say two, two, two things. First. The success that we have, let's say, in health, in immunization, is in death that is averted. It's very unlike when you're building roads, you can measure how many kilometers of road that you've built. But when you immunize a child against measles, in fact, you only count, you, in fact, the, your, your gain is in life, not lost. So it's very difficult to see that ordinarily, to quantify, to quantify it, it <laughs> because it's in badness that hasn't happened. The second element, when you look at malnutrition, for instance, it contributes to half the child morbidity and mortality on the continent. It contributes in some ways to that. It affects the cognitive development of our children, particularly in the first one to two years of, uh, one to three years of lives. And the deficit will manifest itself for the entire lifetime of that child, and it's reducing the human capital. Now, for a politician who is looking at day-to-day -day and he's looking at the next election cycle, he wants to build a building, and a road infrastructure that he can show that is attributable to uh, his or her own tenure. It will be more difficult for that politician to see the value in investing in ways that will lead to human capital development that will only manifest or be realized many years into the future. And that's a major challenge. That's a challenge. And it is only a great leader who would recognize that and accept anyway to take that cost on and allow another president or prime minister, uh, a head of state, to take, you know, to get the benefit from that. Um, finally, really winding up, um, what message do you have for Africans watching this show today? And I want you to look at that camera 
this one right here and give them a message from your heart. Africa has tremendous potential. It is ours to harness. This is the challenge of our generation uh, to manifest the potential that Africa has. We have the people, we have the natural resources. It's left to us as Africans to develop working models that will manifest that potential. That will be our contribution to the world. I think the world is looking for solutions. It's obvious what, what is happening in Europe, in North America, and other parts of the world, uh, that Africa has a big piece of the puzzle that the world needs to ensure sustainable development into the future. So it is ours as leaders in Africa to seize this moment and manifest this potential that Africa has. Okay. It's up to each one of us to seize the moment and realize the potential of the continent. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mohammed. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Many thanks, Ali Pate, for your views on health in Africa. Now, we have a special message from Grasha Michelle. She is the patron of the Stand Up for African Mothers campaign. This is an AMREF effort seeking to train over 15,000 midwives across the East African region. Let's hear what Grasha has to say and then get some of your thoughts as well. I am thrilled to join AMREF on this wonderful initiative of training 15,000 midwives on the African continent as a contribution to meet the Millennium Development Goals, more specifically the one related to maternal mortality. Of all the Millennium Development Goals, this is the one which is leg lagging behind in a very shameful way. It doesn't require a lot of money. It doesn't require a huge kind of effort. But women have been neglected. In many occasions, they take the last, the last of concentration of effort to meet their needs. This is why this initiative is to reverse that so that in 2015, we can look into our eyes and say, governments, private sector, research institutions, civil society organizations, families, and mothers themselves, we have done our best, and we could change the situation in which a birth becomes a nightmare but a birth can be a moment of giving life and also a moment of joy. Let's work together and this can be achieved and it is the challenge you and I have to accept. Many thanks to Grasha Michelle, who is, of course, an exemplary woman and leader on the African continent. Thank you for standing up for Africa, Mama Grasha. Now, we move straight to Africa's top 10. We're looking at countries that are providing the best healthcare on the African continent. Let's take a look at the list. Using a combination of available data, including infant mortality, life expectancy, and prevalence rates of HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, this data was compiled with a view of identifying Africa's health champions. Here is the list. At number 10 is Benin. Mauritania comes in at number 9. Following this in 8th place is Namibia. Madagascar comes in at number 7. And following this on the list is Cape Verde at number 6. In fifth place, we have Morocco. And coming in fourth is Mauritius. At number three, we move back to the north of the continent, it's Algeria. At number two, still up north, is Tunisia. And in the first place, we remain in the north with Egypt taking top position. 
that is Africa's top 10. the end of the show we leave you with the words this week of the great Nigerian author Chinua Achebe and he says while we do our good works let us not forget that the real solution lies in a world in which charity will have become unnecessary I couldn't agree more blessings to you and blessings to Africa I'm Julie Gishu I look forward to seeing you again next week